Come on, can you stand your feet and welcome up Pastor Jackson tonight? Hello, Emerge Church. How are you doing? It is so good to be here. You can take your seats. That was so nice of you and band. You can have a rest. Thank you so much. I do want to take the Emerge Youth Band home uh, to Sydney. Is that okay? Um, they're the best of the best. Uh, I'm like, wow, they're legit. Um, hey, it is so good to be here, and it has been three years in the making, and I feel so privileged. I cannot tell you how privileged I feel to have spent three days with one of the best youth ministries in the entire country. And uh, you have the best youth ministry, perhaps, in the entire country. And uh, uh, having been youth pastor for seven or eight years now, um, I've met and seen and been with a lot of youth pastors. And what is happening at Emerge Youth is very special. Who loves Emerge Youth? Yeah. Now, now here's a question for you. Who loves your youth pastor, Pastor Jason? All right. Because... Because not only did I spend three days with the best youth ministry in the world, uh, in, in a, you see how it keeps getting better and better every time I say it, um, I also spent three days learning from a phenomenal youth pastor. In Australia, there are few like Jason Bedville. And Pastor Jason, I want to honour you as one of the best youth pastors in our nation. You are an exceptional youth pastor. An exceptional youth pastor. And... And, and, and finally, before we get into the word tonight, um, you, I don't know if you know, you probably do, every, every guest speaker I imagine would say something along these lines, that your pastors are like the mama and papa of the Australian church. Um, who knows that to be true? And I am so honoured to, number one, know Pastor Mark and Nina, um, and number two, to be so believed in by them, and to have spent you know, not a lot, but so much time with them in the big scheme of things. And uh, they were in Sydney one day, and uh, I was lucky enough to be their driver. They, they visited our church, and so I got to like, and they just loved on me. Usually it's meant to be me asking them questions. They just wanted to know every little detail of my life. So it came to the Monday, and they had a Monday off, and they were going to go sightseeing and have a date day in Sydney. But I liked them too much. And so they had a date day in Sydney, plus Jackson. <laughs> And so along Bondi, we walked and uh, it was beautiful, but I love you, Pastor Mark and Nina, and it is such an honor to be here tonight. Um, all right, are you ready for the word? <laughs> Emerge Youth, are you expectant for the word tonight? <laughs> what about the rest of the church? Are you ready for the word? <laughs> yes, we are. Um, well, I, I hope you're ready. Um, I've, we, on the first night of youth, Pastor Jason preached, we're going up a gear, Romans chapter 12, um, be renewed by the transformation of your mind. Um, then we spoke about where's Jesus found? He's found in the fire. And then I had a prophetic word from, from Emerge Youth about speaking back, about how the Word of God in our mouths is so powerful. And young people who think they're weak, um, if you think you're weak, it's a very easy solution. Put the Word of God in your mouth and start to speak it, and you watch the world change around you. And far out, Pastor Rachel preaching this morning um, about the armour of God. Stop it, Pastor Rachel. That was too good. Tonight, I've titled the word, um, peculiar, I know, I've titled the word, Up to Jerusalem. Up to Jerusalem. For Emerge Youth, I believe this is a word that will set you up for a post-camp uh, win, after you come from an encounter with God. But for those of us who are in the room tonight and you find yourself having been a Christian for a long time, um, I believe this is such an applicable word. Um, one day I was walking along the esplanade along the beach near my house with a friend. I tend to be a bit of a hypochondriac. Um, I grew up with a, 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 a bandage perpetually on my arm. Um, I always had something wrong with me. Anyway, I'm walking, along, um, I'm walking along the esplanade with my mate Ellis and my ankle starts to hurt. And, uh, and so I'm just walking, getting really conscious of my ankle hurting. Then it gets so bad, I'm like, I think I've broken my ankle from walking. <laughs> and I'm about to call an ambulance when I decide to put my, my, my foot up on, you know, just a little short um, brick fence that someone has on their waterfront mansion. And I tie up my shoes tightly. And I begin to walk. <laughs> and I praise God because I've been healed. And it was crazy that one little tightening of some truth found in, 
in my life of just tightening my shoes and in my spiritual journey, a tightening up of the truth of the Word of God in my life saved me from a lot of pain in the journey. Tonight, I just believe that these principles found in God's Word save us from a lot of pain in the journey that we walk with Jesus. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and then jump down to verses 10 to 13. Emerge youth, get ready. I told them, Pastor Mark, to do that the next time you preach on a Sunday morning. It's going to be sick, Um, but don't do it, okay? Um, Otherwise, Pastor Mark won't like me. Um, Genesis chapter 12, here it goes. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Jumping down to verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because of the famine, because of the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know that you are what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. So here we are in, um, in Genesis. As Abram just receives a call and a promise from God. He gets a promise direct from heaven, has like this revelation moment of his calling in life. And the truth is, so many people at Emerge Youth had that moment in the past three days, feeling the call and the presence of God. And it, and it sometimes doesn't come audibly or through your ears, but it comes as a deep grip in your gut. I call it the tug, where God tugs your insides and lets you know you are significant, you are special, I do have a plan for you. And, and for the rest of us, we've all had moments in our lives where we feel the presence of God come down and grip us with a promise, a promise for our family, a promise for our career, a, crum- a promise for our future. However, Abram, he gets his promise and very soon after, he finds himself in a famine. There is no food in the land. So he comes up with a genius plan. He thinks, awesome, I know what I'll do. I'll look around and I'll see where there's food. Oh, wait, there's food down in Egypt. So he packs up his family and they journey without any consultation to God. They journey down to Egypt. And when he gets to Egypt, yes, there is food aplenty. Like there is instant satisfaction for his needs. But then he, he realizes something. They are going to kill me because my wife is good looking. And he finds himself like, cultivating and coming up with this elaborate scheme down in Egypt to protect himself. And what ends up happening is a plague then comes on Egypt. And the Egyptians say to Abram, they're like, what on earth are you doing here? You lied to us. And this scheming continues and continues and continues. And only by the grace of God did this guy get out alive with his family intact. Only by the grace of God. But I want to, um, I just want to, just through my reading of Scripture, I've noticed a common little pattern. And that is, when it refers to Jerusalem, it says we're going up to Jerusalem. We are going up to Jerusalem, the pilgrimage up to Jerusalem. But when it refers to Egypt, it's down to Egypt. Egypt symbolizes the world's way, the world's glory, the world's method. The world's, col- the world's consultation, the world's riches, the world's wisdom. Jerusalem, on the other hand, symbolizes the presence of God, where you go to meet God. And Abraham, in the midst of his promises and in the midst of receiving a divine calling from God, encounters a problem and he has two options. And the two options are the same for you and me. The options are, number one, I can work this out myself and I can scheme my way out of this. I'll look for where I can get instant satisfaction, instant gratification. I go home from camp and I find myself lonely even though I got a promise from God. So how can I solve my loneliness? And what we do is we go into a scheming pattern. But how many people know from experience that scheming only leads to more scheming? And it only leads to more scheming. 
and we live a life that is exhausting as we spiral down the scheming world of Egypt. But the other option is that when we encounter a problem after our promise is that we go up to Jerusalem. That we actually choose, I'm not going to go where the world says that I'll get instant gratification or instant so, like short-term um, immediate solutions for my problems, but I'm actually gonna go and I'm gonna wait on God. I'm gonna go up to Jerusalem and I'm gonna get God's perspective on what to do. So a couple of observations before we, we get into some points. I wanna point out just very clearly, and this is particularly true for, for Emerge Youth after these three days, right? The presence of problems does not mean that you are out of God's will. In fact, you probably will find that the enemy will try and give you a fair few problems to knock you off center after a moment with God. Problems don't disqualify the promise. In fact, I would say problems actually appear after promises. But what's remarkable about the grace of God is that not only are, are, are problems, they come after promises, but it's often problems that God uses to teach us more about himself. And times when I've like cursed the problem, God's saying, I've actually got a blessing for you in the midst of this if you'll hand it over to me. And every problem can be dealt with in two ways. You can either go down to Egypt or you can go up to Jerusalem. In my own life, I have spent years going down to Egypt and it is the most exhausting life one can think of. I have had thoughts in my mind and, and they just sit there in the back of your mind and they're like, go, go into prayer, go to God, seek God's answer on this. But I'm like, no, I'm too clever for that God. I'm so, I've got an undergraduate degree in management and I breezed my way through that, baby. Um, I've got an undergraduate degree. In, I, I will solve this problem myself. But all it does is more scheming, leads to more scheming, leads to more scheming. So Abram, obviously terrified, the plagues come on Egypt, the Egyptians say, what on earth are you doing here? And he learns his lesson, that every time that there is a problem, you are not to go down to Egypt, you are go, to go up to Jerusalem. You are not to find your own solution, you are to let God find the solution for you. That every time you feel um, the pressure to, to uh, provide the answer, First, we will take the time, no matter how inconvenient it is, to wait on the Holy Spirit and get the solution. And we see this because in a few chapters later, or actually the very next chapter, Abram encounters another problem. Him and his cousin Lot, are, um, they're on the same land, and the land can't support both of them. And so they have a problem, who gets what land? But Abram's learnt his lesson this time. Abram has learnt his lesson. And he says, Lot, you choose. Whatever you have, I'll have the rest. And whatever you don't have, I'll have. You go left, I'll go right. You go right, I'll go left. I'm gonna leave the solution to God here. And I believe whatever God decides in this situation will be the best for me. So a couple of points for us tonight. Number one, scheming is exhausting, but prayer is powerful and full of rest. Scheming is exhausting, but prayer is powerful and full of rest. I want to remind us tonight that there is nothing better than going to God in prayer. It can seem inconvenient sometimes. It can be hard sometimes. You've got to make room and be diligent sometimes. But I tell you what, how much rest comes through prayer? It's the place where God says, I'll take all the burdens off your shoulders. I'll take all the pressure of figuring out your life and the family solution that you're looking for. I'll take it all off. But so often, we choose scheming, which is exhausting. I was on student exchange in Italy um, when I was in year 10, and I went on a day trip. I heard that your family, um, I might be wrong, but your family is from Naples. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah, near Naples. I, I stayed in Avellino in um, in. Avelino, no way. I, was, I lived there. Um, and there's an island nearby, island of Capri. Um, and it's a day trip. You just catch a boat there and catch a boat back. And it's like this, like it's almost like a Santorini type island. It's so beautiful in Italy. And so I go on a day trip and I pay 12 euros to catch a ferry over to, um, to Capri. And I'm like, yeah, this is epic. I spend a whole day and I'm like, this is fantastic. 
But I'm in year 10, and I think I'm the most smart person in the whole world. And I think to myself, as I'm coming back, I think I can get back cheaper than 12 euros. So you know what I do? I bought for five euros a cargo ferry, a car, like a cargo ferry back to the port of Naples. Not knowing that the cargo ferry does not take you to the, the passenger terminal where all the tourists go and where all the buses and trains are to get you home safely. It takes you about three hours the other way to the most dodgy part of Naples that you've ever imagined. Now, I tell you what, I arrived in Naples. How's this? I arrived in Naples, and the first night that I got there also, I got in the car, the host family speeding me 170 kilometers down the highway with no seatbelts. And I was like, well, I'm in a different country. <laughs> I'm in, I'm, I'm, I've arrived at the passenger, actually, that first night that I arrived in Italy, they turn on the news and someone has had their, their hand out the window um, in Naples and they had a watch on. Someone come through on a motorbike and cut off their hand to get the watch. This is the type of city that we're living in. And so I arrive to save seven euros in the darkest, dodgiest part of Naples, and I can't speak any Italian. This is what happens when we scheme and scheme and scheme. We say, I don't have to spend time in prayer. I can sleep more. I will sleep more. I will do this more. I will spend more time doing other things, trying to figure it out myself. However, scheming is only exhausting. It only leads to more scheming, whereas prayer is powerful. I often find myself at the movies with my wife, at a movie that I don't want to watch. <laughs> and I thoroughly enjoy it because I get to sit there, and I just stare at the screen and I have no idea what's happening. But as a man, I just am like thinking, like just, just figuring it out, figuring out how to solve all the world's problems. <laughs> and isn't it true? We feel like we've got all the answers. No, the Holy Spirit has all the answers. And often the answers that we won't expect and that we can't plan for, if we've got a problem, no matter how small or big, it's the Holy Spirit who will provide the answers. Jeremiah 29 verse 12 says this, and then my people will call on my name and I will listen to them. James chapter one says, ask for wisdom and I'll give it liberally. We've just got to make time to go up to Jerusalem. Number two, there is always a way and always time to go up to Jerusalem. There is always a way and there is always time to go up to Jerusalem. How many times do we say, I don't have time? I don't have a way. And you know what? The enemy can come in and speak to us and say, you don't know how to get to God. Yet I want to challenge us. There is always time and always a way to get to Jerusalem. It doesn't matter what we have to do. Open up the Bible. God will provide an answer for us. I'm thinking to myself of all the times that I, I'm like, I'm on Netflix. I'm at the gym. And I, I firmly believe that the gym leads to better mental health. But there are some times where it's like, Jackson, turn off the TV. Jackson, stop just talking back and forth to your wife about this issue. Stop just gossiping to your friends. Stop scrolling Facebook. Stop looking at every other thing. And Jackson, spend time with God. Get up to Jerusalem. Do you know that there are problems that each of us have in our lives right now that ha God has a solution for, but we've not asked him? That there are people in the room today and we are living in, an in anxiety and fear. There are people in the room today and we've buried our head in the sands because we don't, we don't go up to Jerusalem and we, we know that we don't have the answers and, and, and where our, our procrastination is making the problem worse, not better. Yet this whole time, the Holy Spirit is right here saying, I've got a solution for us. I've got a solution to this problem. I will provide for every single one of our needs. That's what the Holy Spirit says. But we've got to go up to Jerusalem. Um, I if you didn't tell from the um, previous story, I hate um, spending money. <laughs> I'm a stingy, stingy man, um, especially when I can get out of, um, out of money. I'll find a cheaper way, I'm telling you. Um, I can always find the best meal. But there is one thing that just constantly gets me in my everyday life. And that is 
when I pay $4.50 for a coffee and the coffee comes back terrible. That is one of the worst things. I'm not kidding, church. That can actually ruin my day sometimes. I'm like, this is, I paid $4.50 for this. And you think you can make me a bad coffee? No, sir. I also just don't have the guts to take it back and say, no, you a new one. Um, but it ruins my day. $4.50. Because I hate the feeling of being ripped off. I hate the feeling of investing into something and not getting the return that I should. Can I tell you something? You will never feel ripped off when you give God your time. You will never feel ripped off when you say no to something to spend time with the Holy Spirit. And it takes time. And when it's a busy season, yes, you have to get up at 5 a.m. and spend time with God. If that's what you have to do to get your solution, praise God, let's do it. God has a solution for every problem. No matter how big, no matter how small, and I know that there are people in the room and you've lived a lot more life than me, but this isn't any other principle than what we find in the Bible. He has solutions for us. We just have to make time to go up to Jerusalem. And number three, Jesus made a way for Jerusalem to come to us. I'll get the band up if I can. Jesus made a way for Jerusalem to come to us. Do you know what's crazy that I find about the story of Abram? Because he really was saved by the grace of God. But you know what is like the kicker here? Is that his own mistakes put him in that predicament. God didn't walk him to Egypt. God didn't walk him to a place where he was about to ruin his life and his family. No, Abram did that. Abram left the will of God Abram got himself into a problem and really it should be on Abram to get himself out of the problem. Yet it was by the grace of God that when he went down to Egypt, Jerusalem came to him and plucked him out and made sure that him and his destiny and all the promises on his life were to come to pass. Here's the thing that I love about the grace of God is that it's Jackson that gets himself into these problems. I'm the one that walks myself out of the will of God. I'm the, often the one that makes the unwise decisions that gets me into the problems that I need solutions for. Yet God, by His grace, He says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. You open up a little bit, I will make sure I come down and I'll provide the solution and rescue you out of Egypt. I, um, I, in, back in 2019, I had one of the most stressful times at work I, I've ever had. And I was stressed. I felt the pressure for probably about four weeks. Um, I love God. I love Him with my whole heart. Um, but in those four weeks, when the pressure mounted, my time with God was more a check of the box. Yep, read my Bible. Yep, a few verses done. And I've got stuff to do. Um, the pressure was on. And so I am, I am internally imploding because I can't find a solution. I wouldn't have said that language, but I'm like, I am internally imploding. Day by day, I'm like hunching down more and more and more and more. And I am I'm fidgety and I'm, I'm losing my mind. My relationships are strained. Um, and I am just, I'm, I'm losing the plot basically because the pressure is unlike anything that I'd ever experienced. This whole time, I've got this thing in the back of my head it's not conscious, but it's like it's this, this little voice that's saying, you need to go on a prayer walk. You need to get your dog, Bella. Throw the stick over her arm. <laughs> and you need to go on a prayer walk. The Holy Spirit was saying to me, back of my head, not conscious, but I knew it was there. I actually knew God has a solution for this. But for some foolish reason, I was just so stuck on figuring out this myself. And for weeks, I was imploding more and more and more. Doing life more and more and more. One day, I'm in my living room. My family lives in, and I used to live with my family home, which is a beach shack, very close to the beach, but it's basically a falling down over house. I remember being near my falling over door that doesn't really fit in like the door frame. Um, so the door doesn't really close. So I went up to the already open door. Um, I thought, I am going to pray. I'm going to give God a shot. 
I remember opening the door and after six weeks of almost crippling anxiety, like internal world absolutely imploding, I remember opening the door and as soon as I took a step, oh my gosh, the peace of God that flooded over me in that moment. I'm talking like it was a dry desert that got drenched with a river of water. I'm talking it was the best feeling I I possibly have ever had after an absolute drought in my soul and imploding. As soon as I made time for God, I didn't even, I took one step and guess what? Jerusalem was waiting for me. Jerusalem had come to my door and Jerusalem was right there. God's presence was right there waiting for me to just take the first step. And it reminds me of that verse in James chapter 4, verse 8. It says, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. We get ourselves into these mistakes, but it's God that comes down and reaches out to us. The pressure isn't even on ourselves to get to Jerusalem. As soon as we open our hearts and make time for prayer, no matter what the problem, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the the bank is saying, no matter what the school report is, no matter how crazy the children are going, no matter what's going on in life, no matter what sickness or disease is plaguing the family, as soon as we draw near to God, there He is waiting for us every time. And I learned an important lesson. Jackson, go to God as your first strategy, not as your last strategy. Go there quickly. Run to the presence of God. Stop living a life of scheming. And I'm gonna pray for people where you feel like you're caught in the cycle of scheming. Stop scheming and get to the presence of God. Because really, to get to the presence of God is in one sense, only one step. In Luke chapter 19, there's a story of a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is, uh, the Bible says he's a notorious tax collector. And, um, uh, sorry, a notorious sinner. He's a tax collector. He rips people off. He's self-professed ripper-offerer of people. And and he hears that Jesus is, is walking past and there's a crowd of people around him. So he decides to climb a sycamore fig tree. So Jesus is walking past and it's not particularly a surprise that he says, hey, you up in the tree. What is a surprise is that he says, Zacchaeus, up in the tree. He called him out by name and he said to the notorious sinner, I must dine with you. As soon as they were in that house dining together, Zacchaeus stands up and says, I've been a liar and a cheat and I rip people off, and I will repay everyone. He, he starts to repent and starts to um, experience restoration. He goes, I will repay everyone that I've ripped off, and I'll even repay them four times the amount. And Jesus looks at him and says, salvation has come to this house today. How crazy is it? A little bit of curiosity, a little bit of an open heart. Jesus looks at the man and no matter how bad he is, no matter what situation he got himself into, he wasn't like us common sinners. He was a notorious sinner. And and Jesus says to the notorious sinner, the little bit of curiosity, the little bit of the open heart, the little bit of the drawing near, I will dine with you and you will experience the restoration of God. For us today, you will experience wisdom, and wisdom liberally. You will experience the solution. You will experience the Holy Spirit's anointing that calms raging seas. His grace that turns situations that were against you around for your good. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me tonight? 